So hi everybody, welcome to this week's video. It's a little bit different from my usual educational videos. I'm going to be highlighting several healthcare projects that I've chosen due to their positive influence of either staff or service user patient experiences. So today I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking to some GLOW STARS. GLOW STARS stands for, I've written it down so I get it right, Gloucestershire Hospitals Staff Transition and Retention Support Network for newly qualified practitioners. So thank you to our GLOW STARS, Charlotte, Leonora, Sharon and Matt for giving your time today. I know how busy you all are and it's fantastic that you're sharing your work. As you can gather, I love everything about this project, the face to face sessions you offer. Um, you can ask staff can ask anything. You do walk rounds and you're going to give us some insight today about your project. Um, and I think sometimes um, some areas, especially I work in a large trust, that you get some areas that silos that have fantastic support and then other areas may not be as supportive potentially. And I think one thing for me that you've got out from this project is I know that Glow Stars is about supporting new starters. That message is like a collaborative message that's got out there. So your new starters must know that. Um, so it's wonderful to have you. Enough of me talking. It's about you today. So um, what would be great is if you each gave a brief introduction, first of all, just to introduce yourselves. So Charlotte, do you want to start? Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Charlotte Yakapal. I'm a registered adult nurse. I've been qualified for five years now um, and I'm a senior practice development nurse and I'm a Gloucester's peer support guardian um, at Gloucester Hospitals. And we uh, have collectively been working in this, but I have a background in acute medicine and I also have done digital specialist nursing before. Um, but the majority of my passion has sat within medicine in the acute sector. Lovely. Thank you, Charlotte. So, Leonora, do you want to? Hello, my name's Leonora King. I am a practice development nurse and a peer support guardian for Gloucester's at Gloucestershire Hospitals as well. Um, I qualified in 2020, so nearly three years ago, and I worked in surgery before moving into practice development and peer support. Lovely. Sharon, do you want to? Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sharon Manzima. I am a practice development nurse and a Gloucester's peer support guardian. Um, prior to this, I have worked in acute medicine and respiratory. I have been qualified for just over seven years and uh, I have been in this role for the past sort of couple of years as well. Lovely. Thank you. Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Matthew Stewart. Um, I'm a practice development nurse and peer support guardian again at Gloucester Hospitals. Uh, so I've been qualified for just coming up to five years now. Um, and before I was in this job, I was working in trauma and orthopedics. So surgical is my background. Lovely. So thank you so much for giving your time today. Um, so I thought I'd start with Charlotte first, um, just to talk through where the idea for Glow Stars initially came from. So Back in 2018, I uh, undertook the Perceptship Programme here in our trust. Um, and during that time, um, I'd gone to an area, I'd started up in an area that I wasn't familiar with. I didn't know the staff, even the specialty, it was all new to me. So brown, fresh new start, that's what I chose. Um, and my colleagues who also qualified from the same university as me, some of them were in different areas. And the Perceptship was a place where we met um, and during our lunch, we would talk and catch up and, you know, we were all having very different experiences based on where we were, what type of support we were getting, what supernumerary time we'd had. Um, and when we were at university, we'd kind of talked and discussed how we had space to reflect on what we were learning and what we were developing in practice um, as, as, you know, future nurses. And we felt that we weren't necessarily having that same space protected for us as newly registered nurses. Um, and so my colleague Sophie Finch-Turner and I um, talked about that a bit more and thought there's a gap here, there's something missing, like our perceptions providing us with competency-based learning, which was essential, we needed that, we wanted that, um, and gave us you know, other avenues to, to communicate, reflect, but actually what we really wanted was a place to kind of potentially even offload some of the experiences we were having through transitioning into this new and, you know, 
quite daunting role when you're qualifying. Um, and so we talked about how we might be able to create a space for that. And we thought there must be other people thinking this just like us. So we took to Twitter, we looked around, we did a research-based search uh, to try and find out if is there anything, what are people doing? And to our surprise, actually, we couldn't find much. Um, we were really shocked. And so we did come across uh, Dr. Jane Ray's um, from the University of Hull STAR project. And that was kind of encompassing a lot around student transition. And so we kind of looked into that, sought out advice from her, or maybe if there was anything she knew about. And we talked about the idea of creating a space for reflection. And she, you know, it was very empowering to us and encouraged us to go forward with our idea. So we decided to um, be quite courageous about it and go and talk to our perception leads and talk to our chief nurse about this idea, essentially. Um, and actually, we were welcomed with open arms in the sense of this sounds like a great idea. It sounds like an amazing quality improvement initiative. Why don't you consider doing it in that way? And so that's really where it started from. Um, and that's kind of where the idea was born. Um, and obviously that stakeholdership at the beginning was a key turning point into even starting that process into doing something about it. Oh, that's amazing. And what's lovely, Charlotte, is the way that you sort of explained the process for influencing change. And I've got a video on influencing change and through publications. And But what you talked about really is the importance of networking, that you had this idea um, that, you know, you were passionate about it. And early in your career as a student going into preceptorship, you were able to influence that change. And that's going to be very inspiring for some of the listeners out there, viewers, sorry. Um, and also you looked at the research and then looking at the gatekeeper, starting with the chief nurse who was supportive. So I think that's fantastic. So can you tell me a bit more about the process of setting it up? Because essentially it's like if we look at a service improvement project, you're looking at, say, the PDSA cycle, the preparation, doing, study, act cycle the preparation bit and the process of actually setting something up like this that's been so successful or any tips or anything out there sure so yeah I mean it was it was a whirlwind um so Sophie and I we didn't work in the same department in fact we actually worked on completely different locations as well across two two sites for the the trust um and what we decided to do was um in the first instance we um did review and did a mapping of who are the people that are going to help us be able to do anything about this? Who are the people who are going to be able to influence our idea to start? So we did that mapping of the stakeholders. At the time, we didn't know much about stakeholdership and networking. And actually, this was a part of that learning journey that we had to go on and utilise very experienced members of staff who did know about this stuff, who knew how to enable us. Um, and, you know, we hit walls. We had conversations that didn't go anywhere. We had people who were like, you know, it's not going to work. It's not really a good idea, you know. We had those and it would be wrong to say we didn't because it wasn't all rainbows and daisies, you know, but actually it was important to have those conversations, too, because we also understood where we would need to overcome barriers, where that would be a preventative to us. So um, that was really a great opportunity to explore that. Um, and because we did it together, it felt somewhat easier because we had each other to support one another. And I think that's really key as well. If you feel like you want to embark on an idea or a project, see who those key people are for you but also who's coming with you on that journey because the more of you there are the more support and the, the the bigger you can build momentum towards it when you're maybe feeling disheartened or you know I don't really know if I can do this actually it's really important to have that critical companion with you supporting you and having uh, thoughts about different approaches um, and so in terms of that mapping we then went forward what we did was undertake um, some quality improvement sessions which we were supported to do by our line managers after much discussion um, and trying to get them to agree like this is something newly registered nurses should be doing like we absolutely need to work on this momentum our ambition rather than you know you should be concentrating on this because you've just started out which is a conversation a lot of people probably would face and we did ourselves but it was all about the rationale behind it. So you're using evidence to justify, no, actually, there's a clear gap here. We've evidenced it. Here's the evidence. Here's the support from senior leadership who want us to deliver on this. All of that mattered in getting it on the ground in the first place. Um, so that was a really key part of that process. And as you mentioned, PDSA cycling, that was going to be another key component to us um, because we wanted to basically trial some uh, ideas. So we pulled together a driving diagram. What are we going to try? What do we think are going to be the influencing factors to implement the change here? So we decided very first instance to go with some simple things. We wanted to make ourselves present and known on the perception programme, as in we're here, hello. 
that was really hard. You know, we the, the program's full. Where do we go in? Um, and we started off in that graveyard shift right at the end where it's like everyone's getting their bags on and you're like, hello, hello, hello. We're, we're these people. We're going to help support you. Um, and, but we've grown so much then to become a core foundation part of the perception ongoing throughout. And that's just the point, really. You have to start with this maybe yeah. uncomfortable working through that so that then you can move forward into those change steps because it's never going to be easy. That's what change isn't easy. Change is difficult. Um, but it's worth the challenge it's worth the way it's worth the impact as a result um and so again looking at those implementations we also started a twitter account because we wanted to gauge not just interaction we knew the interaction wouldn't just be local if that makes sense we knew it'd be wider but what that would offer us is opportunity and platform to seek out more expertise more ideas of other people doing it more investment into the idea and therefore keep that momentum going. Um, and so we utilise that in that way. We tried to do some tweet chats. Um, and then we also wanted to try and see some people out in practice, but we knew that wasn't really going to be achievable as such because we didn't have facilitated time. We didn't have capacity. It was so it was very much me and Sophie being like, we're going to try and see somebody after a shift if we can. But that was really difficult. And that's where we that was our starting point. And it was very much just nurses then um, and ODPs who were also on the nursing perception. But it was close to that group of professionals because um, that's where we started our change idea. And we also had had the lived experiences. So we felt that we had justification for supporting those. Um, at the time. Um, and that was really the, the key setup for going through what we need to get done. So setting up driver diagram to understand what are we trying to achieve? What's our vision? What's our aim? Where are we trying to get to? What does good look like? And then working back as to how we're going to achieve those steps. Um, and constantly through that process, PDSA cycling, is this working? Is it not? If it's not working, let's decide we're going to offload. Um, and maybe we create a new space or maybe we focus on something that is working really well. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and that took us to the kind of point where we were establishing a network at that point. Brilliant. So two questions I've got for you. With um, When you were getting your evidence at the beginning, at the start, so that's so important with any service improvement or change. What evidence did you use? Did you use did you do surveys of staff or, or what? How did you? collate and analyse, not analyse necessarily, but what evidence did you have for your baseline? Is what I'm trying to say, sorry. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so initially, uh, before we even reached out to, to people to get involved, we just did, uh, we, we utilised our library services within the hospital and said, would you help us do a literature search? These are the things we're looking for. So we're looking, you know, impact of um, transitioning in newly registered nurses. Uh, student to nurse transition, you know, anything like that that was going to indicate to us support systems, anything. And that's when we kind of came across this this idea of like pastoral support. But it was very at the time there was very limited literature on it um, in that sense, although we knew that there was an issue. So we knew that young nurses or nurses who are early career were experiencing hardships at work based on the, the kind of struggle of transitioning and that a lot of them were leaving. So we used that data to also elevate our pitch in terms of there needs to be something done about this um, because the data showed us that people were leaving the register within first five years of qualifying and things like that. And that was then, you know. Um, and so we used that type of research. So um, we also looked at anything that was published in an article. We looked at TED Talks on, support, on, on generally like the, uh, the process of transitioning and how hard that is and how mentally strained that can be and how important it is to have support around that type of thing. We looked at um, charity based work. So we, did, we looked a lot at MIND, which is what influenced the peer support aspect um, and giving and, and what, what peer support is to and from people. Um, and the whole idea from the very beginning has always been about peer to peer. I'm here, I'm going through these experiences, I'm here to listen to you as well, um, and, you know, sharing and, and giving, it's about giving and receiving, and that's what peer support is all about, um, and that's why it can be given in such an informal way, um, and actually that's also very comfortable for people, because sometimes the idea of formal processes around offloading or supporting isn't what people are looking for, and maybe it leads to that, but actually that initial I'm here in this space with you and I need to talk to somebody is so important to people um, and the evidence showed that and the experience and feedback shows that so we also in that first six month cycle of uh, doing our implementation change ideas to the perception we sought out feedback um, so we would um, we did a, um, a light grid scale on how well supported people felt from the beginning of the perception right. to the end 
um, and we did uh, qualitative feedback in the sense of how are you feeling? What is it you need? What would you like to see in practice? That's where we started to get years, basically, cohort after cohort saying, we want to be seen in practice. We want you to come and visit us in practice. We want you to come and have a conversation with us, spend time with us, see us. That has come up every single cohort since we started. Um, and that's why eventually it became a high priority of what we do um, within the network. Brilliant. So, so um, one thing I wanted to say, so what you've shown really as well is the um, it's a lot of work to drive forward. You can't, you've got to have that baseline data and the evidence. Did, was Sophie a student as well as you? Were you both students, did you say? So, so Sophie and I had just qualified um, yeah. as registered nurses at the same time because we went to university together. Yeah. Um, we both joined the same trust and undertook the same perceptionship programme. Um, but that's where we connected um, and, and then made this idea. So and then from there, following the perceptionship, although the conversation started right near the end, the last kind of month of the perceptionship, we then were deciding to meet up, catch up, call, whatever it is, have a right. coffee so that we yeah. can talk through our ideas. Um, yeah. And we were both determined to make a difference because we yeah. knew the impact it was having on us and our colleagues um, and even just Sophie's experience to my experience was very different in terms of but we were in the same organization at the same point of our uh, experience as a registered nurse but we were having completely different experiences and that's why we recognized it was so right. important to have space to talk yeah so so in relation to the gatekeeper you went and spoke to the chief nurse but what did you just do it all yourselves because you had knowledge of service improvement I'm so sorry because I've got a bit of um ready nose today um or did you have somebody from sort of quality improvement helping you or was there somebody that sort of led you through the process because you achieved an amazing amount as two early career nurses um was it because the chief nurses are very busy but was there a group of people that helped you or was it one person that sort of guided you and led you or did you just do it all yourselves so it was kind of a uh, we, we I'm not going to say that we weren't lucky we were very lucky to have a really transformational chief nurse um, yeah. at the time and actually that was that was a significant factor yeah. in us being able to get this off the ground however for us to get it to to him in the first place um we actually a, ourselves had to have the audacity, basically, to feel like, no, we're going to be heard. Yeah. So um, that was about us cheerleading each other, I guess, in that sense. Um, and that's what I mean about partnership and doing things collaboratively. It makes you stronger. It gives you a bigger voice. It gives you better application. Um, but actually, we also had, um, at the time, Sophie's matron. Um, she was a um, very approachable person, very ambitious, always kind of trying to elevate the voices of early careers people. Um, and so we we tied into that. And so we took the opportunity to talk to her. She loved our idea. She's the one who elevated our conversation with right. the chief nurse. And through that, that's where we were able to have that conversation. And they became our two key stakeholders. And so it, it was really easy then in some sense of when we were being challenged, perhaps like perception, you know, with all the will in the world, actually we haven't got capacity to keep you on here. When the chief nurse is saying, no, we need to get them on here, it gives it a sense of gravitas that, you know, you, you're not able to maybe get on your own. So actually those relationships, building that communication, so important and, and having those yeah. people invest in your idea really key from the beginning. Thank you. Um, so just last question to you, Charlotte. Do you think your initiative could be easily mapped across the UK? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, maybe I'm biased, but no, no, I, I definitely do. It's it's something that has been an ambition of, of the group, of the team, um, of the network, um, because we we don't want to gatekeep something that's special and has impact for people. We know through feedback, we know through literally lived experiences that this work benefits people in the workplace and it makes a difference to their decisions. It makes a difference to perhaps the confidence they have in delivering their care and it makes a difference to their day to day. Why wouldn't we want to share that with other people? Um, and so we've had really great opportunities to share our work, showcase our work across different platforms, locally, internationally. Um, and actually what's been great about that is um, the, the star aspect of Gloss Stars is, is that staff transition and support. 
network right why can't that be in every single trust across the uk yeah. why can't that be in other organizations that aren't nhs based why can't it be in social care what we've talked about what i've mentioned is peer-to-peer -peer. that can happen anywhere it yeah. could literally happen anywhere but it's yeah. the model of that practice it's the idea of recognizing that practice and enabling people out there to recognize their role in doing that with colleagues um and actually essentially once you've got that groundwork in that's it's a, it's a free solution because you're creating a space where people do this and rely on each other to create a space of support and change a culture of the way they support one another, behave and accept, you know, how people are experiencing um, their work. Um, and actually the impacts of that are massive. So we're always meeting with people, happy to talk to people, sharing as much as possible because we know that it can be replicated. We know that it can be mapped to fit in you know, a person-centered way through other people's approaches because obviously there will be differences in organizations in fact only last week we were at RCN Congress presenting this at a fringe event and talking to somebody about how they could set it up in their own care home so actually it can be mapped essentially across any setting. Oh amazing and hopefully we're sharing it on YouTube it'll help us all. you're going to inspire a lot of early career nurses I think as well the fact that you can have that idea and that passion to change practice in such a positive way so well done uh, right so I'm going to move on to the lovely Leonora um, so Leonora who I, you call yourselves glow stars don't you is that right am I using the right term I say yeah so oh, let me just take that off um so could you talk me through what a glow star does your typical day supporting others um and also for example do you work full time in your role or do you work clinically part of your time or is it like a deemed as a clinical educator role so is that okay I know they've asked you about three questions there that's all right so there, there are kind of two halves to that question so we on the screen we're peer support guardians for Glostars so Glostars is the network but actually we're made up more of volunteer guardians so we've got volunteer Glostars guardians and early career guardians who are across the organisation so we've got over 150 uh, multidisciplinary volunteer guardians who role model peer support in their workplace and they're not as Charlotte said initially it was to support newly registered nurses but actually peer support can be replicated across any profession it's that peer-to-peer -peer, non-hierarchical so we've got multidisciplinary guardians as I say in a range of clinical um, clinical professions and non-clinical so that anybody can access peer support at any time at that point of need so someone who's working on a shift with you someone who you can go to to ask for que ask questions and they're happy to be approached so for people who are new to the organisation particularly, but actually for anybody, if you're looking for some career advice or wellbeing support or signposting, or just have some questions and don't know who 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 to go to, who will know the answer, um, who can I trust, who's going to actually have time. I'm not saying that obviously our guardians have all the time, but they would do it in a supportive and approachable way. Um, so they wear our volunteer, well, our guardian badge and lanyard, our Glostars badge and lanyard to show that they are approachable um, and they're across the organisation as I say. So breaking down volunteer guardians even further we've got Glostars guardians which are the majority of our guardians and we've got a small group of early career guardians so everybody on the preceptorship so whether that's nursing AHP or therapy preceptorships on the last day of their preceptorship so when they finish that preceptorship they're given the opportunity to become an early career guardian so it's a development opportunity for them um, a space and an opportunity to develop some skills to network and they are the best people to support the next cohorts coming through that transition into newly registered life share their experiences they come along or we invite them along to the preceptorship groups as well and it's really good opportunity for them to to actually have this opportunity I say um, and then at the end of a year they offered um, if they'd like to become a Gloucester's Guardian so transition into that Gloucester's Guardian role so there are two volunteer roles um, and they feedback any themes to us so we have uh, Matthew will touch on this um, 
in a bit more detail, but we have a monthly peer support council, which is again a multidisciplinary council with over 160 odd members. Um, and anybody who offers support of some kind in the trust is invited to attend this as well as all of our guardians. So they can feed back any themes to us and then we we escalate those themes through the the channels that we've set up um to make sure that they are listened to and that actually we are hearing the voices of our colleagues on the floor essentially but also we use that as an opportunity for us to share any information to then be dis disseminated down to colleagues whether that's learning opportunities or upcoming webinars or courses or whatever that might be so it works both ways um but our roles as peer support guardians. So initially we started on a one day a week basis um, <clears throat> just over a year ago, March 2022, we, we started. Um, and we go out and do peer support check ins with everyone undertaking a preceptorship. So at the, as Charlotte says, this is what people wanted. They wanted us to go out and see them. So we started. Everybody on the preceptorship, we committed to visiting them at least once in their workplace. They don't have to then seek us out. Of course, they can, but we are going to them just checking in with how they're doing. And you don't know what you're going to come across. It's not a tick box exercise like, oh, how are you? Yep, tick, been there, done that. It's a, how's your day going? And you don't know whether that will be actually today's going really well and you can celebrate that with them and you can help them reflect and what's going so well and how are you going to replicate this um but also sometimes you can turn up and just say how are you and and you they might burst into tears because they're yeah. so overwhelmed and then it's it's a case of supporting them through that and is it supporting them to have conversations access further support whether that's mental health well-being support or just covering their break so you go on a break, you have a cup of tea and we'll help, you know, cover the floor. And actually all of that makes such a difference to them. Um, so as I say, we committed to visiting them at least once and that then led to actually we want you to come back again. I'm OK now, but can you come back and see me again in a few weeks, a few months? Um, so we've got we've gathered a lot of data, but um, our cohort last March 2022, about 40-50% asked us to go back and visit them again. Um, so fast forward, you know, we we now are committing to to seeing them more than once in practice, and it's that person-centered approach of of how much support they need. Um, we also see them three times on their preceptorship. So at the start, these are our star sessions. At the start, we do an introduction to Gloss Stars and give them a pin badge um, that they can wear while they're undertaking the preceptorship to recognise, for other people really, to recognise that they're undertaking a preceptorship programme and also for them to be able to network with each other. We do an Ask Me Anything session halfway through, which is an opportunity to, for them to literally ask us anything. Um, and then we do a reflective, like action learning set, restorative supervision session at the end um, and help them you know plan their next steps and reflect on their journey so yeah that, that's essentially what we do it's in amazing. a nutshell I mean, it's a lot though isn't it and what I love is the fact that you're going out and, and it's almost like you've got that assurance that every you know that everybody's going to be met so that nobody's just sitting there really struggling you're going to pick that up that's what I love the fact that you're going to pick up if people are struggling and then you can offer that support and also for retention we need that to make sure that Absolutely. you know so so it sort of links to retention to assurance but well-being it covers everything doesn't it mm -hmm. um and under that remit and in relation to the themes I don't know if Matt's going to talk about that later but when you do feedback if you are Matt just saying because I'll, I'll come back to you later but um with the themes, how do you when you feed them back, are you feeding them back to managers or I suppose it's dependent on what the themes are? Um, or is, is there like a, a, a very sort of structured approach in the trust sort of to governance it that it, things get done? Or do you just do it on an individual basis as a glow star and go and talk to the manager? Um, I don't it know depends with, yeah. what we come across. So yes, yeah. if it's something that needs dealing with then and there, it can be through the manager and through through that approach. But overall themes, um, it tends to be either directly to us if they're through the peer support check ins or through the volunteer guardians. And then we have got a governance process and a governance structure. So it does get fed up through um, people within 
I, uh, Matt, just correct me. I can't remember. <laughs> My mind's just gone blank. <laughs> That's right. So it, it tends to then sort of go through our sort of well-being leads within the organisation right. through our sort of that way, because we realise that obviously there's stuff around staff experiences, staff well-being, and that's where we tend to sort of give most of these themes. But as Leonora said, we do give it to managers. We also give it back to our um, volunteer guardians as well. They give us this information. We say, well, this is what you guys are saying to us. Yeah. So it gives them that point as well to see what other people are thinking as well. So um, it needs nicely on to the next question, which is Matt's question. But just before I do that, because it sort of fits with Leonora, um, in relation to you were sort of saying you never know what what somebody's going to say or how somebody is when you go to see them. How do you support your sort of mental health and and um, yourselves because you're taking on a lot sometimes I can imagine it can be quite um, hard sometimes so how do you sort of unwind and deal with that aspect of it? I mean, this, it's going to be different for everybody. Everyone has different approaches to kind of self-care and well-being, don't they? But we're lucky to not only have each other, we've got a really supportive team. We're a small team, as you see, and we all share an office um, and we're practice development nurses as well. So both of our jobs, we're, we're combined. Um, but we also work really closely with the project lead and the lead nurse for professional nurse advocacy. So we can have regular restorative clinical supervision oh, ourselves brilliant. and we're trained professional nurse advocates. So it's we're not taking on people's problems as such. We're using that kind of coaching method yeah. and that restorative supervision to enable them and empower them to take ownership and come up with with action themselves and we'll guide them through it. Of course, we we know that we have access to whether that's the staff psychology and wellbeing hub or RCS ourselves, but we've also got a really good network amongst ourselves. And just one last question, Leonora. So when you're if you're going to become a glow star and have that label, is there any governance around that in that they have to do the PA course, the um, professional advocate course, they have to have um, know how to signpost for wellbeing? Like is there a training program? For yes, all, so yeah. it's it's not as structured as they have to do the professional advocacy course no. because of course that's that's well it's for nursing and midwives at the moment, um, and our volunteer guardians are across the the organisation and some are unregistered and some are not clinical, so and the fact that that's a level seven course, so. Yeah. It, <laughs> They don't have to do that. It's it's a kind of it's a more informal way. It's recognizing the skills that they do have. So a lot of our guardians are in roles such as clinical educator roles or doing support of some kind already. But they, that doesn't mean that they have to. Um, everybody who wants to become a guardian, they can either send us an email or register through the intranet, and then we invite them to an induction. So we do an induction, set our expectations of them, um, their expectations of the role, building that relationship from the start. Um, and then we check in with them throughout. Yeah. So they have an opportunity to feedback with us. And, and we obviously make sure that that governance structure is, is monitored and reviewed yeah. regularly. And that's really helpful because I think a lot of people out there, maybe managers out here, out there watching this, and it's important for them to know how you sort of implemented it as well. So moving on to Matt, um, how do you feel that you've made an impact since starting the role, Matt? Yeah, so for me, I think we've we've made a really positive impact in that whole thing of retention, that support, that peer to peer, which we've all been talking about. Um, I've been involved with Gloss Stars when Charlotte and Sophie first started um, coming in as a volunteer. So I've been there with them, um, not as much as them too. They, they really were the pioneers of this. But we had those problems. And as Charlotte said, year on year, group after group, they were saying to us, we want to see you in practice. Can you come and see us? And it was really hard um, sort of saying to them, very sorry, but we're full time clinical. We're trying to do this as well. So when we were brought into these jobs, actually, it was something very quickly, which we all said we need to do this because this is what they want. And again, we've got the data which we've had, which Leonora said about that. That's the impact for us that people have told us um, verbally when we've been talking to them. And I know um, we've got case studies and things like that, which just show how much of an impact we've made to our preceptorship colleagues but not just our preceptorship colleagues, to all of our colleagues as well. Yes, it started with that preceptorship nursing, 
that mm. because we're wearing the badges and the lanyards ourselves, you, you get stopped by anybody and asked questions, which is what we want to happen and offer that support, which is where having our 150 over that now of multidisciplinary guardians and then being visible as well has just elevated that awareness because that was something else we sort of did when we first started was gauge what people knew about Gloss Stars and it was very limited. And of course, now we've got had time to embed the network and also talk to more people. More people are more aware of it now going forward. And it's a lot of that just creating those safe spaces to talk. So as Leonora said, the Ask Me Anything session, it's obviously a, a room full of receptorship colleagues and it is very much of you can ask us anything what happens in this room stays in that room and we also use um, an online thing called slido so it's all anonymous as well and it just gives us that bit more truth behind it as well because some people can be a little bit afraid to to say in a room full of people as well yeah so again that links back to seeing people actually in practice and again it's having those skills and talking to people by sometimes you can tell when you're talking to them they want to open up but don't feel comfortable so you you then sort of have to talk to them in other ways and it is always about building those relationships and those connections with people but the other thing we've also done is bring together all these people who offer this support and some of them were working in silos as well yeah. but bringing them all together in this peer support council as we've said it just gives people the chance to discuss concerns and we've we've had concerns which have come up from different groups who have just said we don't know what to do we've gone as far as we can go help and it's it's a really supportive group to sort of look at those issues and problems and problem solve together in one open space and again there's no hierarchical intent with that whatsoever everybody is the same in that group and that's something which we really try and instill to all of our guardians as well it, it doesn't matter um, as I've said to guardians when we've done inductions, if the chief nurse or the CEO of the organisation comes to you and wants peer support, you are entitled to give it to them. It, it doesn't mean that you have to be at their level as well. That's amazing. And the two key things, I think, for me are the visual element that people know to go to you, that you've um, everybody across your trust and you've made it really visual with the yellow um, and the lanyard. Um, and, and you make it easy for people to access that support, but also having the different strategies, because you're absolutely right, Matt. Some people in a group might be find it easier. Some don't. Some prefer one to one going out to areas. So you've got that outreach um, and you've got all these different strategies and methods. Um, you've not just picked one. You've been really flexible. You've used a really dynamic approach, I think, which is admirable. One thing I did want to ask you um, and Charlotte at the beginning was saying why it started and as a student going into preceptorship. Um, but Matt, do you give that message to students? Because I think that's something that's very important because students really worry about that transition. So in the in that way, have you made an impact with students, do you think, Matt, where they know that if they come to your trust that there's these glow stars? Like, Do you go down and talk to them before they register, for example? So, yes, yeah, so there's a few different things with that, which we've done over this time as well. Obviously, by visiting our perceptorship colleagues um, and anybody out in practice, really, Again, we're out there being visible, so we will gladly yeah. talk to students whilst we're there as well. And um, we also have it when other colleagues have said to students, oh, um, we've got a third year student, they're going to be starting with us in six months time. You'll see these guys on preceptorship. They're out in practice. Just look out for them wearing the badge on the lanyard. So by us having time to do some of this work and in, as I said, embed it, actually the word has got out there and because we make yeah. a conscious effort and make an impact on that first day of perceptorship to explain who we are what we do give them the perceptorship pin badge they have our contact details it's it's slowly fed through over the last couple of groups and cohorts um of being embedded more and again managers have picked this up as well and managers are, are asking for us to go and see people um across their workforce really as well uh so that's I, I forgot that you could people students are going to see um you in placement, aren't they? It's a bit like you've just said as well. So Sharon, you've been waiting patiently. I'm sorry. <laughs> um so um last but not least, 
Um, could you give us any case example, obviously without mentioning names, but where you've made a difference? Can you share sort of any actual example, do you think, from practice? Of course, I think we, we have oh. had quite a few um, cases that we've we've been a part of, but there's a couple that have been quite significant for me and I think for us as a team as well. Um, the first one was um, uh, uh, one of a newly registered nurse um, they had started on one of our acute wards um, and we had seen them as a standard, so generic preceptorship check-in um, and where they were able to tell us how um, they had had their supernumerary period. Um, however, part, they had been off sick for part of that, so they hadn't had the full um, period they were supposed to have. Um, so they wanted more, they felt they needed a little bit more time to settle in and get used to, get used to it. However, they hadn't been able to have it. Um, they had tried to speak to their manager and it had been promised that we would try and facilitate this. However, that was never extended. So um, unfortunately, I think they ended up having a, a minor sort of drug error that happened. So they reached out um, just for some support, which we were able to support them in a practice development capacity. However, following that, we went back in for uh, well-being check-ins as a as cluster as, as cluster guardians, uh, which we were able to do throughout that process. So even though we were supporting them, so they said individual, I think we're able to they themselves realized actually, yes, I'm receiving support from you know for these people, but the environment I'm in is not the right environment for me um, because I'm not able to flourish. I'm not able to be the best version of you know the best version of person that I want to be. So we then supported them in that transferring to a different department um, entirely. So we facilitated those conversations and those transfers and we were able to move them. Um, so that was such a, I think it was a, such a powerful because once they moved to that new area, they then flourished. I think their confidence, um, their confidence improved a lot. And um, they did sort of send us feedback as well, I think after that in just terms of how um, thankful they were. And I'm just going to read out a couple of sentences. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as part of the feedback yeah. that they, they, yeah. they did give us. Um, so uh, the teams have been very visible during my time as a preceptee. They have supported me through a difficult first ward placement and guided me through a transfer process to a new ward. Um, this and um, had this support not been available during this time, I would most likely have left the trust completely. The team offered opportunities to meet up on shift outside of the clinical areas. Being able to ask questions, take guidance and receive support from this team has made my preceptorship period much better than it started out. So I, I think that was just very powerful. And again, as a testament to what we do, that something, the fact that we had checked in, that first check-in during preceptorship, they had already identified that these are people that I can reach out to. These are, this is a safe space that I, no matter what I'm going through, I can reach out and these people that would help me through that. Um, so that was, that is, yeah, that is, we hold, we hold that very dear to your heart. Yes. It's an amazing um, example, Sharon, because that person would have left. So you've had a massive yes. impact there. That's the that's yes. and, and it must give you such a feeling of um in that role of that positive feedback as well. Because I know like Leonora was saying, there's difficulties, but then you've also got that positive. You've all sort of put forward how positive it is as well. That you know that role that you're making a difference, aren't you? It absolutely does because you know we, it was something seemingly small. The, the, us checking in and being able to have those conversations, it's seemingly small, but it's had such a huge impact because we would have lost this amazing nurse and we would have lost them. They would have gone either, I don't know, maybe perhaps left the profession or like, gone to another trust. It would have been a loss to us. But through facilitating that conversation, through just checking in, we were able to realise actually, or they were able again to realise for themselves, like, well, actually, I, this is what I want to do. And I know I can do more. However, the environment that I'm in currently is not the environment for me. And then us then supporting them to move to a different area we, we were then able to retain them within the trust and yeah. again like I said them currently are just flourishing so uh, that's oh, just amazing. that's powerful that's, that's, amazing. that's amazing um so I'm just gonna leave now with um just asking you all really um just to give me one piece of advice and I'll start with you Sharon um could you leave us with one piece of advice for any newly registered nurse who may be finding it hard in their first role and then if we go around to everybody just before we finish I, think, uh, I would say ask questions 
ask ask questions um, to everyone, the people that you're working with. If it's about your new role, what you're supposed to be doing, um, anything that is new, ask, ask questions. If you're struggling as well, reach out, ask. Even if the person that you ask may not know, they will be able to signpost you or they will be able to signpost you to someone who does so like well actually i don't know about that but i know someone who does or i have had someone who does this or they can e help escalate that situation for you because i know being a newly qualified and especially if you're having a hard time that chain of you know going up to then speak to your manager it may be quite daunting as well but even if it's just your colleague or if it's just the you know your healthcare assistant that you're working with if you just speak to them they can be that advocate for you they're that peer that can help support you through it so whatever you're going through ask questions and ask for that support and it will, it will be there for you. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Very wise words there. So I'm going to go thank backwards. You. Matthew, if you could just give us what your take on that advice. Um, so, so I suppose mine is don't compare yourself to the people that you trained with. Um, each of us develop at own rates and at different speeds, exactly like when you, you're a student as well. Um, but it is very easy to compare yourself to others and your peers that they might be having a better experiences than you or they're developing more or they're being put on more training than you at any one point. But at the end of the day, you're still going to get to the same outcome of where you want to get to at the time you want to really. So I'd say that's really mine. Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. Lee Laura, do you want to give your piece? Yeah, mine would be around if you find that you're not in an area that you are flourishing in, it's OK to move. It's OK to learn other skills. It's OK to transition and transfer that actually all the skills you can learn in lots of different areas, they're transferable skills that are going to help you in your career and your decision making and your professional career. So it's not necessarily that the profession isn't right for you. It's maybe that area and there are loads of different jobs that you can have in nursing, so see if you can move into another one. Thank you, Leonora. And Charlotte, last but not least. How do I top that trio? Oh, um, no. <laughs> well, I guess um, I would encompass what everyone has said by saying, uh, I think it's really important for people to remember that um, the challenges that we face are opportunities for growth. Um, and actually, it's really natural to feel really overwhelmed um, at the beginning and not only at the beginning, actually, through throughout your nursing career. Um, but with time, lived experience, self permission to keep learning, you'll be able to become the confident and the skilled nurse that you've aspired to become. Um, and so really just to stay committed to, to learning, seeking guidance from your colleagues at all levels, not just above, but at all levels. Um, and actually remember that your dedication to helping others is going to make a positive impact on people's lives. So keep pushing forward, uh, keep being yourself, keep being authentic and know that you are capable um, of making a huge difference to people's lives, your patients and your colleagues. Oh, thank you. And what a lovely way to end. So thank you so much to every single one of you, to Sharon, to Matt, to Leonora and Charlotte. I really appreciate your time and it's a wonderful example of support for new starters, um, showing early career nurses how they can implement change um, and also for managers or educators out there that are, you know might want to map some of this work. So um, if anybody has got any comments, do put them in YouTube and I, I will, I'm sure you'd be happy to network, wouldn't you, and to talk through your work as well, all of you. Anytime. Um, yeah. Uh, and on behalf of the profession, thank you for making a difference, every single one of you. You're amazing. And thank you so much um, for giving your time today. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.